Hello, I'm Bruce Gewertz, uh, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and Surgeon in Chief at Cedars Sinai. And it is truly my pleasure to welcome uh, to the podcast today Ed Phillips. Ed is a close personal friend and is unquestionably uh, the most respected general surgeon here at Cedars Sinai. Ed, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ed, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I was uh, born in Boston when my father was doing a fellowship at Mass General in cardiology. Uh, he had been actually born in Los Angeles, which is pretty rare. His parents had immigrated from Lithuania. And uh, so we went back to Los Angeles at the end of his fellowships. I was about four years old. So I really lived in Los Angeles my entire life. I went to Berkeley uh, for the college in the 60s and uh, came back and went to USC Medical School and then stayed uh, at USC for my surgical residency. You know, I know your dad was a very prominent and beloved cardiologist here. Did you always want to be a doctor? I, I pretty much. I think I did. Uh, you know, I he gave me a book uh, about Banting and Best discovering insulin, and uh, it w it was so riveting. A uh, young boy dying of diabetes and the lab racing to isolate the pancreatic juice to develop insulin to save his life. And, of course, at the end, they did. But uh, really, I think from about eight, nine years old, I, I definitely wanted to be a physician. And what about surgery? With your dad being a cardiologist, you strayed pretty far from the family uh, business. Yes, uh, but he was encouraging. Uh, there were a couple things that happened. One, I did the work in the lab with Bernie Lown on a defibrillatory pacemaker, and we operated on animals, and I enjoyed that actually quite a bit. Uh, but I never thought I could be a surgeon. I really thought that it was uh, too much to learn, too much skill. I didn't think I was capable of it. And uh, in my rotations at County USC, I happened to end up on the service of Leonard Rosoff, who was chair of surgery. And he really sat down with me and said, look, I, I think you're a surgeon. You don't know it. And I said, well, I, I just, you know, the surgeons, they, they know everything. They do everything. It's really, you know. Uh, I don't think I can do it. He said, you can do it. And he encouraged me. Uh, and uh, he said, do a medical rotation. In those days, they had medical internships and rotating internships and surgical internships. Nowadays, of course, it's required to do a surgical internship. But I did a medical internship at his request and then uh, got accepted into the residency. And it was, he was absolutely right. It was just the perfect thing for me. Well, I think the reason you went into surgery is that uh, Leonard's uh, secretary was uh, Nancy, who became your wife. That's, that's my <laughs> that, opinion. That is absolutely true. He, he covers everything for his <laughs> residents. <laughs> those are the days where chairmen were really powerful. I, I, I should have lived in those days. <laughs> so when you came to Cedar sinai I know that you had really broad surgical interests and capabilities. And in fact, I know that you did the breadth of all surgery, from vascular surgery to complex general surgery in every area. Uh, what was it like and how did you define your interest in gastrointestinal surgery? Well, you know, it was an interesting time uh, when I applied here at Cedars to be on the staff. They had closed staff. And uh, Dr. Tryman, who's head of vascular, said, no, you can't be in the vascular division because we're full. We have too many vascular surgeons. And I said, okay, I'll just come on in general surgery, which I did. Uh, but at that time, Olympia Hospital was Midway Hospital, and I had vascular privileges there. And I had vascular privileges at Broughton and uh, L.A. New Hospital and uh, Hollywood Community Hospital. And in those days, it was very common to go to multiple hospitals. So uh, obviously I worked out of every emergency room because I didn't have a practice. Uh, anybody would refer me a case, it would be 2 a.m., it would be a carbuncle that needed to be drained, and I'd come in and do it. But ultimately I got busy in trauma because no one was really doing trauma. And uh, I couldn't go to all those hospitals because my patients were really too critical. And I made a decision to just come to Cedars and Everyone thought I was crazy, uh, but it worked out fantastic because I was here, I was available. Uh, doctors would call me because their patients in the medical ICU were sick, 
We didn't have hospitalists. Uh, and I really got busier at Cedars. And uh, I expected my volume to go down. But I, you know, I was basically, I was doing all the liver resections, all the whipples, all the big cases, um, and trauma. Well, one of the remarkable things I think, Ed, about your career, as I've come to know you of these last 15 years, is that you were a superb, what we call open surgeon, in that you would, uh, you know, enter the abdomen, chest, or, or, or whatever, and do your work open with your hands. And yet, you really led the pivotal change in surgical technique, what, which was to the minimally invasive laparoscopic uh, area. Did you immediately recognize the potential of laparoscopic surgery, and what was it that turned that light bulb off in your head? Yeah, it, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, when I was a resident, there was diagnostic laparoscopy on the liver service, and there was diagnostic laparoscopy, obviously, in GYN. The only thing that they would do would be fulgurate tubes. So it wasn't, um, you know, there was no big push for laparoscopy. It was, you know, kind of a weird little side gig that the hepatologist had, and we would do it for diagnosing carcinomatosis and things like that. So I didn't have any particular love for it, but in my vascular uh, experience, I did a lot of microscope work with small vessels, which I enjoyed. I just, I intuitively enjoy the finesse precision of vascular surgery uh, and I think it's those skills that made it easy later to adapt to laparoscopy. Uh, when I first came to Cedars, Dr. George Bercy, uh, who most people know has been involved in laparoscopy for many many years, um, he asked me to be involved in a project where trauma patients that had penetrating trauma would undergo laparoscopy under local anesthesia in the emergency room. And if there was no peritoneal penetration, let's say of a stab wound, they could be discharged. Well, that was a pretty upsetting kind of, it didn't work, basically. And it was kind of an upsetting experience to be the second assailant to the <laughs> patient. But, uh, you know, it kind of tweaked my interest a little bit. Uh, and then he asked me to be the surgeon on call for the extracorporeal lithotripsy trial that Siemens had. Because in case there was a case of acute cholecystitis, they needed to have a surgeon available. So I ended up interviewing these patients and I had no idea uh, how horribly they felt about cholecystectomy. I always thought it was a great operation. You made a little incision, you packed away the colon, you reflected the liver, you did the surgery, and you know, five, seven days they'd be going home. I thought it was wonderful. And these patients had stories of their parents, their grandparents suffering, dying, having incisional hernias, bile leaks, you name it. And it really set off a flashlight in my brain that there was a big discrepancy between what surgeons thought and patients experienced. And that got me immediately rolling that pretty simple to remove the gallbladder if I could develop a clip applier, if I could develop a dissecting device. And that's when I went into the lab and started working on the technology to be able to do it. Well, you were truly a pioneer. And, and I can't help but think that in addition to your ability to think mechanically and develop instruments and delivery of those instruments to where you were, that, that part of it was the fact that you were uniquely skilled and experienced in open surgery, and you were able to replicate the same technical key points in, in removing a gallbladder laparoscopically. Uh, what, do, what do you think uh, are the limits of laparoscopy, and how will uh, robotic technology uh, extend those limits? Well, the limits of laparoscopy, I think, are visual. You need to have a light source, and I'm not sure in the future we need that. But present laparoscopy is based on light, and I've always thought we should really be doing it with ultrasound or some other imaging, because light, you know, there's shadows, there's, you get depth perception from that, but still, you can't see around things. You're working as a team for the first time. Your assistants can see on the monitor, so it, 
might not be the best light for your assistant. Uh, so I think, you know, that's the biggest uh, hurdle. Of course, what we always call the stick aspect, that the instruments are just rigid sticks. Now, there have been some kind of sticks that have multiple uh, degrees of freedom at the end. But it's also dependent on the smart placement of your working ports. So if you don't put your working port in the right place, then you may not be able to access the area in the way that you want. So it requires a lot of experience and thinking. Um, and I think uh, the robotic platform has the ability to function inside the abdomen at different angles that are not dependent on where the working port is. Yes, you have to have the working port in generally the right hemisphere, so to speak, but it doesn't have to be so precisely uh, dedicated. Do you think that a robotic technology will make it, um, well, I guess let me phrase it slightly differently, that um, in order for an operation to be uh, widely used, it has to be able to be done by the average surgeon. Correct. And there are certain things, uh, whether it's open surgery or laparoscopy, that are only done by the most expert clinicians. And those operations rarely proliferate because they're just too hard to do for the average surgeon, who may be highly competent but not supremely gifted. Do you think that robotic technology will enable higher competency for that average surgeon to do complex intracorporeal work? Well, we're hoping so. Certainly, you bring up the intracorporeal work of suturing, which tends right now in laparoscopy to be the breaking point from the average surgeon to a more experienced laparoscopic surgeon. Uh, a person that can suture can do any operation and get out of trouble as we can in any operation. I think um, we're at a very early phase in robotic uh, technology. I've always thought that when we could put a loop of bowel in the right hand of the robot and put another loop of bowel in the left, push a button and say, do an anastomosis, go get a cup of coffee and come back and see it, then we're starting to approach the true capacity of the robot. And I really do think we'll be able to uh, for instance, put in limits so that if you can have a preoperative CT scan, you can know exactly where the common duct is. And if the surgeon accidentally invades that space, the robot won't let them. Like a car will start beeping, and now we have cars that automatically break if you get too close. And I think that's where we're going to go in the near term with a robot. It'll absolutely not let you get into that space. You may ultimately override it, because there may be anatomic variation, what have you. But I think that's where we're looking at the average surgeon operating at a higher capacity with fewer complications. One of the other things I've heard about is that you could potentially download some kind of three-dimensional anatomy of that individual patient into a robot, such that the robot would intuitively know in a stereotactic way where all the structures are because they will have an image that's exactly gated to their uh, motion. Yes. I, I think that's the future. Of course, in the abdomen, with every respiration, the liver is moving, the intestines are moving. Uh, and right now, that's the challenge, is how do you accommodate for that movement? Um, and, you know, I'm sure that software and other things and computing power will ultimately overcome that. So do you visualize a future uh, in which there will be hardly ever a need to open up an abdomen, as an example, to do a surgical procedure? Well, that, that's a little far in the future. Uh, I could say yes, but I'm not, I'm not convinced. I think trauma will require some open surgery, not all. But, uh, you know, I can't see this. I, I have seen the DOD research both in the United States and Israel about, uh, you know, robotic uh, surgeons on the operating theaters in the field of war, and uh, it can't work because they're so e easily targeted by the enemy and opponents. So uh, the hope that you could limit the surgeon's exposure to warfare just never turned out and, and probably will never happen. So I think there still will be a role for trauma. 
Now, one of the concerns for all of us in, in virtually every surgical field where things are becoming increasingly minimally invasive is that we are training a generation of surgeons that did not have the kind of exposure you had, for example, uh, to open surgery or the kind of surgeon that had my experience in doing open aneurysms, which are now virtually unheard of in, in the world of endovascular surgery. How are we going to address that? In other words, if a, if a surgeon gets into trouble uh, because of anatomy or pathology or whatever, uh, doing a minimally invasive uh, surgery, that is a very difficult open procedure to salvage that patient. And, and when Ed Phillips isn't, isn't sitting in the surgeon's lounge, how are the uh, younger surgeons without that experience going to deal with it? Well, I, I am very worried about that. Uh, years ago, I was just kidding with a friend that at least in my senior years, I could teach open surgery because none of the young surgeons would know anything about it, how to open and close an abdomen. Um, I'm very worried about that. I, I'm not sure how we're going to do that unless we can teach a robot how to teach surgery, which would be the ideal solution. Well, the robots would be cheaper than the surgeons we're employing right now. <laughs> so in your long career, uh, and, and very distinguished, given lectures all over the world and, and revered as a teacher of surgery as well as a master surgeon, what do you think has been the most satisfying element of your career? I think really the most satisfying is doing a good operation and having the patient recover and be grateful and on a very uh, granular level. Uh, I enjoy taking care of patients. Now they're also a great source of angst as well. Uh, so from a personal level, I would say that's the primary, but I would love, I love inventing, I love developing programs. I love bringing doctors together uh, and developing a program, creating a program, and then passing it on to the next generation. That's probably my greatest overall enjoyment. Well, you certainly walk that walk. There are many surgeons that are now uh, getting to the mid portion of the career that you have personally uh, mentored here at Cedar sinai and, and I'm sure Ed Phillips' legacy will remain long after we've both, uh, both left this place. So, Ed, we, we very much uh, appreciate uh, your coming here today and, and uh, delighted to have a chance to speak to you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.